place after the readings where we would have a hall. So the father here, Galaza, has just been summoned out of the confessional. He's going to uh, uh, we'll see up here, deliver his first talk. Father Peter is speaking on repentance and conversion within the life. Venerable Metropolitan Andrzej Kitsky, one of the pillars of our Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church. Father Peter Galaza was the uh, was the cool liturgy, uh, cool chair of the liturgy at Shetinsky Institute. K-U-L-E. K-U-L-E. Yes. That's right. But he is K with a C O O L as well. well. That's quite an interesting man. I told Father Peter before that uh, uh, just recently actually that when I grow up I want to be just like him. Uh, Very bad. He said my eighth grade is already grown up. So <laughs> that's the way it went. But um, we met Father Peter. Many, many years ago, uh, and uh, it's been a wonderful friendship. He taught me uh, my class at the Chapinski Institute, and he's just been a real uh, guide uh, and mentor for us uh, whole back. So it's a true joy to uh, welcome you here to, uh, to speak about this man who you are uh, so passionate about as far as, as his contribution to the church, uh, his uh, incredible witness to the Lord uh, in a time very difficult. Please, Father. Good. If we could, I know you've been praying already for a half hour, but if we could just kneel and ask the Lord to, to bless this retreat in a special way, praying to the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. Lord our God, we bow before you, we, we beg you, we plead with you, Lord. Open our hearts. Enable us to be filled with your all Holy Spirit, your spirit. We ask that your spirit drive from our hearts all spirits that prevent us from having open ears and open hearts to your word. Lord, cleanse me of my sins, of my impure motivations and intentions. Enable me to be a vehicle, an instrument, so that your word, Lord, what you desire for us to hear this evening may indeed be proclaimed unto your glory, the glory of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, now and forever and ever. Amen. Slava Jesus Christ. Glory to Jesus Christ. There's a, uh, a story that uh, I, I suspect you, you've heard, uh, and so I, I apologize if I'm uh, providing you with uh, something that uh, you're very familiar with, but it's, uh, I, I love to tell the story at the beginning of a retreat and, and all sorts of other in, in, in endeavors because it's, it's just right on the mark in, in some ways. Besides, it gets your attention. So there's uh, the story about a, um, a priest who is the neighboring priest of a priest who needs a replacement one Sunday. So he goes out to the neighboring parish to replace his colleague on Sunday morning, and he arrives you know, at, at the church, and you know, there are people milling about in the vestibule, et, et, et cetera, and he's about to just kind of run through the narthex, you know, the vestibule, the entrance of the church, uh, and he notices uh, on his way through the entrance of the church that there's a little box there, kind of donation box, and he's thinking to himself, well, you know, the, the, the people here, you know, I don't want to give a bad impression or a bad example to these people who are standing around here. I, you know, I, I, I should, I really should, Put something in the donation box. So of course he reaches into his pocket and he uh, he's got two quarters there. He puts them into the donation box and he you know proceeds up to the altar to to celebrate the divine liturgy. Uh, the divine liturgy is you know fine. Everything is 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 is, is okay. Uh, he finishes the divine liturgy and he's you know leaving the church. And the sacristan comes up to him and says, "Oh father, father, don't leave yet. Uh, we have this." Uh, uh, practice here, you know, we're, we're kind of a small parish, we don't have much of a, a, a budget for, you know, the, the priests who come to, to replace our, our pastor, uh, but we do have this custom that everything that's in this box here, 
uh, is given to the priest who's replacing our pastor. So the priest thinks to himself, hey, could be pretty good, you know? I mean, who knows what, what, what's in there, right? Well, of course, as I can see from the smiles, you've guessed that <coughs> the sacristan opens up the box and what, is, what, is, what, do, what does the priest see? Two quarters, right? So father goes home, you know, and he's, he's a married priest. He's, uh, he's probably somebody like uh, uh, Philomena. Philomena is what, six years old? She's the kind of person that, that, that would have this, this interesting insight. He, he's sharing the story of what happened, you know, the, the two quarters with, with, with his family. And the, the daughter in the family says, so you see, Tato, if you had put more into it, you would have gotten more out of it. <laughs> and that relates directly to something that Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky said about the nature of spiritual exercises. And the reason I'm going to be using him as an example of what it means to get closer to our Lord Jesus Christ, to change our lives, is first because this is the 80th anniversary of his passing into eternal life. He died uh, in 1944, so this is his 80th anniversary. And the other reason is that this man has already been declared venerable. He's taken his next step towards beatification, which is a step towards proclamation as a saint by Pope Francis himself. In July of 2016, Pope Francis declared him venerable, which means that Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky has demonstrated heroic virtues. That's what it means to be declared venerable that he's got heroic virtues. Now, I don't know about you, but especially during the last couple of years, and especially with this you know, war in Ukraine and, and everything, I mean, there, there, there have been times when I'm saying, okay, I, Lord, give me some kind of example. Give me something, give me a sign, give me something that I can latch on to, to be dealing with just one catastrophe after another so that I can maintain my inner peace so that the, the enemies that are winning all over the world, I mean, it's just one after another, just, you know, everybody's, you know, dropping bombs all over the place, so that they wouldn't win my soul, so that they wouldn't conquer my soul, enable me to maintain the spiritual equilibrium that I need so that I can have the proper attitude towards my kids at home, my grandchildren, my wife, my neighbor, my co-worker, okay? enable me to live in that kind of dispassionate, tranquil way. And as I was thinking about that during the last couple of years, I thought to myself, who is a better example, at least, you know, in, in our church, in our, you know, modern church, modern church meaning anything after, you know, 1744, in other words, the modern period, who is who could be a better example than Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky of someone who has had to deal with one catastrophe after another and emerges with such a powerful resonance of peace and harmony and love that even, even Jewish people in Ukraine and outside of Ukraine have declared him to be an example of what the world needs, okay? So it's not just Ukrainian Catholics, you know, because he's, he's one of us, you know, we like to, everybody likes to have a hero, you know, yeah, look at, look at you know, our church. No, 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 I can give you a whole string of, of people who don't belong to, to any church, who aren't even Christians, who don't even believe in Jesus Christ, who have been just awestruck by the example of Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky, okay? So it behooves us, I think, to say, you know, in, in our own church, the man who actually went all the way to Vancouver in 1910, okay? This man who traveled all the way to Vancouver in 1910, and by the way, had eggs thrown at him, okay? His own people threw eggs at him, why? Because he was of aristocratic birth, and, you know, the, um, the radicals in society said, oh, we, you, you don't, you know, you don't know anything about our suffering, you know, and, and, and so, you know, we don't want you here, okay? Anyway, just a little, little footnote about the kinds of things that he had to put up with on a daily basis. So who 
is, you know, who could be a, a better example uh, in the 20 minutes or the 15 minutes that remain to me and then the, the, the time that remains uh, tomorrow and the day after to reflect on so that we can travel and be led along that same path of righteousness. So, what did, um, what did Venerable Andrei Shatitsky tell us about what we're engaged in right now, which sometimes is referred to as spiritual exercises, okay? The retreat, the, the older name was spiritual exercises. And, um, you know what, I was, I was gonna quote him, but, you know, that would just, just a way of making it maybe sound more authentic, but that's gonna take more time. What does Metropolitan Andrei Shaptitsky say about the retreat? He, said, he says, you know, a retreat is a lot harder than any other kind of, you know, just, just listening to a homily. Why? Because you're the ones that have to do the work. This is not about being either entertained or even maybe being, you know, edified, as it were, by what the, hom the homilist is saying. Spiritual exercises, as the word suggests, involve a workout, right? So, he insists that this is what is crucial during a retreat. And so we're gonna start with our exercises right now. We're gonna take two minutes. You have a pencil, everybody has a pencil. Everybody has your little booklet here, by the way. Uh, this is not going to be read by anybody else. Okay, is anybody, you know, the little note thing at the back there? Okay, nobody's going to be looking at this, you know, unless you want to show it to somebody. In fact, what you might want to do after you've written what I'm going to ask you to write about, you might want to take that and, and, and you know, just like rip it up or, or whatever. But anyway, it's on the last, it's the very last sheet, page 18. Page 18, 19, okay. On those, uh, on, on, well, just basically one sheet, what I want you to write is the answer to the following question. Why did I actually, why I, you know, why, well, you, why did I actually come here tonight? Why did I actually come here tonight? Okay, what was my intention? What is my in intention? In other words, you know, you, you're gonna get more out of it if you put more, more into it. I can tell you that, you know, Father Mike Bomback calls me, he says, can you come and do a retreat? And you know, for a while my intention is, um, you know, I would just wanna be friendly to, to Father Mike. Uh, I love his family, he's great people. It's a wonderful parish here, you know, I've never been here, so I wanna see it. Well, if, if, if that's my motivation, if I don't work on that, then I'm not, you know, I'm really not going to be able to prepare and speak in the way that, that I, I should be speaking. So the question for me then is in all honesty, and this applies to each one of us, in all honesty, each one of us has to be brutally honest with him or herself and say, what do I want to accomplish by being here this evening. Now, if you're gonna be brutally honest, hey, I mean, it's the, the way that we, we pray. We're brutally honest with God when we say, you know what, God, I really am feeling lousy, you know? So if you write down, I came here tonight because there was nothing good on TV, okay? Uh, I came here tonight because I wanted to see Joe and Larry and, and, and Mike, et, et, et cetera. That's, that's what you should write. You know why? Because then you know where you are. That's the way the Psalms pray. Lord, I feel lousy. Not, oh Lord, I just feel so good being in your presence, etc. I mean, you know, that's, there are times when you say that. But you have to be honest with yourself. And so if, in fact, the, the motivation, the intention, uh, I mean, whatever it is, you have to be aware of that because if it's not the kind of intention that involves spiritual transformation, you're not, you know, I, I myself, if I'm not interested, in fact, I wrote to myself here, I, ideally, I have to work on, I have to pray, I have to fast these days. 
I, I, I want to be able to work on wanting the Lord Jesus Christ to change my life by enabling me, among other things, to follow the example of saints like Metropolitan Andrei Sheptitsky. Okay? But before I can get there, I have to clean aside all of the other motivation, which is, you know, as I say, maybe I'm just here for whatever reason. So you have to become aware of that. Uh, so write it out for yourself. I, uh, I came here tonight. My motivation tonight is, is this and this and this. Think about that and think whether you want the Lord to take you somewhere further. Hopefully you do. Obviously, you're putting up with my talk until now, so I presume you do, you do. In fact, I know you want to go somewhere and you're here to receive communion. So, so write that down. What is my motivation? What is my intention? Okay? Take, uh, you don't want to do your homework. Okay, no, you're not doing your assignment? Okay. Ah, we should tell you, there are people who don't understand English. There are people who are really Ukrainian language. Okay, nikto. I just ask whether there's someone who, who doesn't um, uh, understand uh, uh, English, who's exclusively uh, the Ukrainian speaker. Okay, because I was, uh, anyway, so if you just want to write that down for yourself, okay? 30 seconds, this is your work, your work. You don't have a, how come, how did they not get a, pen and, uh, a, a pencil, sorry? How did they not get one? Very good, see, thank you, thank you. You're the kind of, uh, person that the world needs, people, you know, in, interactive, you know, like not afraid to, to speak up, okay? So somebody get her a pencil. Hey, come on, folks, help me, give, help me out here, all right? Okay, and a favor, okay, I think they're, they're probably somewhere, okay? And we're going to return to this um, later on, too. Now what you need to understand is that this idea of actually following an example, of imitating someone, that has fallen out of practice. Okay? Does anybody, you're, you're probably, uh, we have people here who are old enough to remember days when people would read the lives of the saints. Remember that, Lives of the Saints, maybe in your childhood? Okay, you read the Lives of the Saints. Well, that's, that is considered in some modern forms of spirituality to be inappropriate, not to be something that anyone wanting to have an authentic spirituality should do. Why? Because there's this current in modern philosophy called existentialism, which suggests that imitating anyone means that you're really not being your true self. In other words, to be authentically yourself, you have to be kind of, you know, recreating your persona, your personality on a, on a daily basis. You know, you, you, you have to be your own person in an entirely original way, okay? Well, it's one thing to be creative, your own person, in, in, in originality. It's another thing to think that anybody could escape forms of imitation. And the proof of that is that in this age when we say, oh, no, no, we're not going to, we're not going to, you know, set up some kind of saint as an example that we want to follow because that's inauthentic, that's imitating. I mean, in that very same age, we have a celebrity culture where one celebrity after another is imitated down to their very shoes, Right? So to be a human being means you're inevitably going to be looking at different exemplars and possibly imitating them. And so the question is, whom do I want to imitate? Well, what I want to suggest to you folks tonight is that we should be wanting to imitate Metropolitan Andrei Shevtitsky. He was born in 1865 in the Habsburg Empire, dies in 1944 under the Soviets, lives through seven different regimes. Seven different regimes, several of which tried to kill him. 
one of which sent him off to Siberia for three years between 1914 and 1917, goes through one death threat after another, and through all of that, is able to exude a love and patience and compassion that I can't even begin to imagine, okay? So I'd like to be, I would like to be a guy like that, you know, because I can't even deal with, uh, you know, I don't know, somebody at the university looks at me the wrong way and I'm already walking around saying, oh, what's wrong with this guy, et cetera, you know? I mean, you know, so what would I do if I were sent off to Siberia for, for you know, for three years? I'd come back a wreck, right? I know that. Well, why should I become a wreck? And we say, well, of course, you know, it's, 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 it's natural. Well, I don't know, you know, they're like heroic saints. The, he's a human being like me. Ultimately, he is, okay? He's got the, you know, same human nature. He may have grown up in other circumstances, etc. But at the end of the day, he's a human being who's able to, you know, go through all this and come out, as it were, unscathed. Come out as, in fact, someone that, that even non-Christians want to imitate, Okay, and I'll give you some of those quotes tomorrow night. So, the, this idea of reading the lives of the saints has fallen out of practice and is something we really need to restore for a couple of reasons. First, as the uh, French philosopher, just so you don't think I'm opposed to philosophy, right, having criticized a certain current of philosophy called existentialism. Just so you know, uh, there's a French philosopher, Paul Ricoeur, who has this pithy adage, we become the stories that we tell. We become the stories that we tell. Now, if you listen to people in, in my generation and, and, and younger, which basically means almost anybody today, frequently the stories that we end up telling are things that we saw on TV or in a movie, okay? Well, you know, if, if it's, a, if it's a something edifying, that's great, but it really is an impoverishment because I remember I was actually born, I was only, I was five years old when we finally got a, a TV in, in, in the house, what, 1960. So I remember a period when my parents would sit around and they continued to do this where they would share stories of the various problems that they had had in their life in Ukraine, various trials and tribulations. And embedded in that story frequently was a reference to how Jesus Christ enabled them to survive or how some ethical principle, help them cope with some form of immorality, okay, et cetera, et cetera, just, just think of it. And, and, and sometimes it was just very, very simple stories, you know, without any kind of grand lesson. But the point is that these were the stories, these are the kinds of stories that all of you have in your families, right? How many of you have uh, grandparents uh, who or great-grandparents who arrived in Canada, let's see, in the 1890s, maybe the 1904, 1905, okay, many, many of you. Now, I presume that you were blessed enough to hear the stories, either from them or from your own parents, or, or whatever, they're the kids of these great-grandparents or grandparents, uh, I hope that you were blessed enough to hear the stories of how your ancestors survived that first winter here in Alberta or in Saskatchewan or Manitoba when it was minus 20, they didn't have enough to eat, and how the Lord Jesus Christ, or just a kind of a general belief in the power of God, enabled them to get through one day after another. Or even if it's not that particular religious, just some lesson that they had heard from their parents, some kind of advice that they had heard from their parents enabled them to, to survive. 
Now, those are stories that could be made into Hollywood movies, right? But our grandchildren and our children, they frequently don't hear those stories because boring. Well, it's, it's only you know, boring because we have accepted this idea that it's only the celebrity culture, it's only TV, it's only action movies that actually are the interesting thing. We can retrain ourselves to be able to share those stories in a loving way with our children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. And so now you're going to write your next little, um, this is the second part of your assignment. What edifying story do I want to share with someone in my family during the rest of Lent? What edifying story? Edifies, you know, something that builds, builds people, something that, is, that, that will inspire my grandchildren, okay? And then you're going to have to start thinking. You might have to start praying. How will I find an opportunity to do that? And I'm going to give you some hints on Sunday about how you might be able to, to do that in an age when, you know, we don't, you know, we just, we don't tend to sit around the, 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 the table as often as we used to and just share stories, okay? So think of a story that you think is edifying, just shorthand, just three, four, five words. What story would I like to share? Do I think I should share with someone in my family? And why? Because we become, we become the stories that we tell. And so I'm just going to finish with something that's very edifying about um, Andrei Sheptitsky, and this relates to, you know, the, um, the first, what, 34 years of his life. And it's just to give you a, kind of an entree in, in, into his life. So Andrei Sheptitsky is a, um, an aristocrat. He's born into an aristocratic family, and if you know anything about the nature of Ukrainian society within the Habsburg Empire, you know, in the 1860s, anybody who wanted to become upwardly mobile, they, they wouldn't go to that local, you know, Greek Catholic church, the local Ukrainian Catholic church. They, you know, they would end up gravitating. It's very, this is not, you know, to criticize anybody, but it's the kind of thing that happens in a society where Sheptitsky's grandfather had already gravitated away from the Ukrainian Catholic Church into the Latin Rite and grows up as, as a Pol Polish aristocrat, okay? Again, no criticism intended. It was happening basically to so many of the elites in, uh, in Ukraine for centuries. But Andrei Sheptitsky, looking at the portraits of his great-great uncles who were bishops of the Ukrainian Catholic Church, okay? During this period of romanticism, you know, it's the 1880s, and he says, you know, I, 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 I think I'd like to kind of get, get into this. And paradoxically enough, it's his mother who had no Ukrainian background. She was like, you know, pure 100% Polish aristocracy background. She's the one that says to him, uh, Andrei, actually he was, he was baptized Roman, Andrei is his uh, monastic name, says, you know, I really think it would be wonderful if at least one of my sons were to become a Ukrainian Catholic priest, to leave this very, very comfortable aristocratic life and serve these poor farmers, because they need it, you know? And so he's, keep, you know, he starts thinking along those lines, but it's his father, the guy who actually does have the Ukrainian lineage, who's obviously very happy to be an aristocrat, hanging out, going to all these cocktail parties or whatever they did in the 18, you know, 80s, you know, all these balls, these parties, etc. Et, et He's very much opposed to his son, Roman slash later Andrei, leaving that aristocratic lifestyle and becoming a Ukrainian Catholic monk. In fact, so much so that he says, I don't even want to hear about this until you go out and get yourself a degree in law. You have to, you know, get a degree in law, serve in the army. And 
Andrei Shevtisky, being an obedient son, says, okay, this is going to be really hard, but this is, you know, this is my dad. He's, he wants this. I'm going to do it. So he goes through this, you know. He goes out and gets himself a doctor uh, of law's degree, serves in the army, which is actually very beneficial because he I mean, actually got sick in the army, but this, this kind of you know, created a, a discipline because he was six foot seven. So this is a guy who needed to be able to you know, know what to do with his body. You know? uh, anyway, he, um, he does all that, and finally, it's, it's a very moving uh, account in the memoirs of his mother, where she says, you know, Andre, the future Andre, and his dad went out for a four hour walk and they came back and his dad said, okay, if that's what you really want, I'm gonna let you do this. So, he gives up his wealthy lifestyle. By the age of 34, he's already consecrated a bishop. And he is the bishop of what today is called ivano Frankivsk. Some of you have heard of that, right? At that time, it was called Stanislaviv, okay? And he writes his very first pastoral, or one of his first pastoral letters to his flock because this guy, the aristocrat, decides that, like the bishops of old, he's going to visit every single one of his parishes. And by the way, if you know anything about ivano Frankivsk, it's in the foothills of the Carpathian Mountains, you know? And the Carpathian Mountains, you've got the Hutzels, these Montenegrins. In other words, not, it's not a nationality. It's Montenegrin, in other words, mountain dwellers, you know, kind of like almost the Appalachian Mountains, as it were. People who certainly, in, 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 in terms of social status, I mean, wow, there, there was a lot of poverty there. And Andrei Sheptitsky says, I'm going to visit all of my parishes. And there's no train. Even if uh, he'd wanted to take a car into those, those, those hills, it would have been impossible because there are no roads. So he gets on a horse and then also uh, on a donkey at certain points, and he visits these various parishes. And before he go embarks on his um, visitation of these, these parishes, he writes to them a, a pastoral letter and he says, you know, I realized that some of you are dealing in your families, you know, in these, these remote parts of the Carpathian Mountains. You're dealing with alcoholism, with various forms of dysfunctionality. I realize many of you can't even read, can't even read or write. You're impoverished. And you probably think that I, as a bishop, would never want to enter your house, your smoke-filled houses. And he writes to them, and uh, the, the original Ukrainian is actually uh, very, you know, it's, well, like usually is in the case of original, the, the original, it's, it's, it's much more moving. But anyway, in, in English, uh, his response to the question is the following. No, no, my, my, my dear brethren. It is precisely these people that I would be most happy to visit first because you are the ones that need the most help before anyone else. And those of you who are dealing you know, in your remote villages with alcoholism, with impoverishment, with various forms of dysfunctionality. And dysfunction, I mean, you're talking about wife beating, who knows, you know, all, all sorts of crazy things. You are actually more dear to me precisely because of your hardships. This was the Lord Jesus' preoccupation to be there where people are suffering. And he says, I cannot do otherwise than my master. This is what my Lord Jesus Christ did. And if this is what our dearest Savior did and continues to do, 
how can I do otherwise? So the very first thing that uh, I just want to begin with tonight about following the example of Sheptitsky is the question of our comfort zone and what am I willing to do to get out of my comfort zone in order to be present to other people in the way that our Lord Jesus Christ would want me to be present to them. And you don't have to get on a donkey and go into the remote you know, mountain areas. Not everyone is called to that kind of thing, you know, to enter homes where you know, the only thing they've got is outhouses, if they even have outhouses. We just have to ask ourselves every morning, what aspect, especially during Lent, what aspect of my comfort zone is the Lord calling me to leave behind to be able to do his will. Slava Isusu Christu. Glory to Jesus Christ.